Hey, good morning. I'm Chris Raggy. And I'm Andrea Grimes. An historic day in New York State as Kathy Hochul takes office as New York State's 57th governor, the first woman to ever hold the position. Hochul takes over for embattled Governor Andrew Cuomo, who resigned following accusations of sexual harassment. The 62 year old is originally from Buffalo and has served as Cuomo's lieutenant governor since 2015. Her administration begins a new era in New York State politics as she inherits immense challenges, including the lasting impact of the pandemic. Governor Hochul was officially sworn in overnight. She just took the oath of office just after midnight, uh, but she will be sworn in a ceremonial ceremony that's set to happen any minute. We're waiting on it. Let's bring in right now as we wait uh, CBS2 political reporter Marsha Kramer and wow, such immense challenges in a historic day here. Well, there's going to be a lot of people looking to see how Kathy Hochul performs today. Not only the people in the state who are looking for solutions to a wide range of problems, but also all the people who want her job. I mean, there's Democrats, Republicans, independents. They're all lining up thinking if she doesn't, if she has a misstep, they're going to try to run for her job. It's a lot of pressure with so much on any governor's plate stepping right into the office. She's got experience at the federal, the local level, so the experience is there. She says she's going to be a different type of governor and then Andrew Cuomo and will govern differently. So what will that mean? Like you mentioned, people are going to be watching for missteps. Inevitably, there will be some. But what, well, what does different type of governing mean? She promised to end the toxic workplace yeah. that existed in Albany. And she already moved to do that by naming a number of top people at to positions, in fact, our two top posts are, yeah. are going to women. In addition to that, she's also going to have to make decisions about who to keep and who to fire from the Cuomo administration. Yeah. And those are very important decisions. And in all of her media um, availabilities over the last couple of weeks, she's said several times, I have not been close to the governor. She was his lieutenant governor, but she's been asked, did you know anything about the sexual harassment? She's been very adamant that she was not close. She was not in the room. She was not in his inner circle. And that's the reporting that you've that you found as well, right? Well, I mean, the bottom line is she wasn't close to him, but this is an argument that works really well for her because she wants to be the un-Cuomo. And so she wants to say, I'm I'm not Cuomo. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to be my own person. And remember, she's the first person in centuries that's not from the New York City area. So she brings a different sensibility to the job. And I think that you're going to see some surprises today. I think she jumps right into the, the vaccine debate and the mask debate on day one to yeah. show that she's got her hands on leadership. So pandemic would be priority one, but then now, with Absolutely. especially with the FDA now giving Pfizer the go-ahead, you can issue more mandates, especially with schools. There's been a lot of blowback between Cuomo and de Blasio. And just in the New York City schools over the past few months, I guess this gives her a little bit more leeway to, to make decisions that she wants to make. Well, but see, the key thing is going to be whether the unions will back her. Yeah. You know, she has a situation where she, she has all these state employees. Will she require vaccines for state employees and will the unions go along? And then will she require other companies throughout the state to do the same thing? And we're looking right now live at uh, the room where uh, Kathy Hochul will be sworn in ceremonially, of course. We're waiting for that to happen at any moment. Moment. As Chris mentioned, 62 years old. She went to Syracuse University. Her husband, Bill. She has two um, adult children as well. Katie and Will. Katie and Will grew up in Buffalo, Irish Catholic family. In terms of her positions, she aligns very much so with, obviously, with Governor Cuomo. She said she fought for the $15 minimum wage, LGBTQ rights. So in terms of policy, similar, of well, course, to the governor. Well, I think you're going to see her as a more moderate version of Andrew Cuomo, who was pushed a little bit to the left by uh, the progressives in the legislature when the legislature uh, uh, took um, took over. And I think that you're going to see her picking somebody from New York City as lieutenant governor who's going to maybe be, give her those liberal progressive credentials so that she can afford to, to run a little bit more centrist. She's called herself an independent Democrat as she's mm -hmm. campaigned in years prior. We'll see exactly how that plays out. Again, uh, waiting for uh, the 57th governor of the state of New York to come back from behind the door there. And uh, again, with the official swearing in happening at 12.01 a.m., we'll get uh, more of a ceremonial swearing in here in the next few moments as we are live here on CBS 2 News uh, with Marsha Kramer, Andrew Grimes. I'm Chris Raggy, uh, and this is set to take place about five minutes ago, so they're running a couple of minutes behind, but of course we'll have these, uh, this ceremony for you in the next few moments. The ninth female governor in the United States. Tenth. Tenth. She's the tenth now. Still underrepresented, but I guess a move in the right direction. <laughs> also, I think it's interesting to note that she's going to be surrounded by a lot of family. Yeah. Her father, Jack Courtney, is actually going to be there as well. And New York today gets its first 
first gentleman of New York State. Yep. Mm -hmm. and the we second of six children. She's about to walk out. Let's listen into the live pictures right now. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today with thanksgiving in our heart. The God of all grace, God that gave us the opportunity to, to be here even on this day, to bless and to welcome our new governor. We come with thanksgiving in our heart. And then we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the God that gives us all things well. We come with thanksgiving in our heart. We thank you for gracious and faithful leadership in this great state of New York. We ask God your blessing upon them as we go through these treacherous times of our lives, that you will, oh God, just give them the wisdom and the wherewithal to have steady hands to know from you where to lead your people. We ask God your blessing upon this state and upon everyone that is concerned about you, O oh God. We ask you to look on and bless and have your own way. Only as you can do. Deliver us from this great task, God. We know you can do all things. You're able to open up the sea and the rivers that Joshua would go across. And we ask God you to do the same today. Open our way and give us safe pass that we can glorify you and that you'll be glorified in all that we do and say. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You'll soon find that brevity is the hallmark of my administration. Uh, uh, I also want to thank everyone for joining us this morning, and particularly uh, Chief Judge DeFiori, who graced me by wearing the same robe that was worn by the first female Court of Appeals Judge, uh, Judith Case. So there is some symbolism in her attire this morning as well. Also, I want to thank Pastor Solomon Dees from Wilborn Temple for gracing us and reminding us of the presence of God here today. I've worshiped with him a number of times and I wanted him to uh, bless this gathering and bless my administration. I also want to thank our leadership who's here today. Our Assembly Speaker, Carl Heastie, Majority Leader of the Senate, 
my great friend, Andre Stewart Cousins. We've been on a long journey together, and I so look forward to continuing the relationships that we've had, but even deepening it. So thank you, and I look forward to a conversation with you on the pressing issues of the day immediately following. And of course, my family, my beloved husband, Bill, who's been at my side for 37 years, my children, Will, Katie, and their beautiful spouses, wonderful people, Matt and Christina. I also have a large extended family here, so sorry to you in the back. I have a big Irish Catholic family with six kids, but uh, I do want to acknowledge um, my parents, my father is here representing uh, in spirit my mother. Uh, Dad, I'm so honored to see you and that you could make the journey here today as well as my siblings. So this is a, uh, an emotional moment for me, but it is one that I prepared for. And I'm so looking forward to continuing the work we have to do. Uh, to that end, I spoke with President Biden last night to talk about a number of issues. He pledged his full support to my administration in anything we need. Uh, particularly, I thanked him for the support we've received from FEMA and others in terms of cleaning up after uh, Henri and how we were prepared. And I'm going to continue assessing the situation. But I do want to thank the people whose lives were disrupted, as well as those who responded, not just to that crisis, but those who continue to fight on the front lines as we fight this deadly pandemic. I also want to thank the uh, hundreds of thousands of state workers who I have such respect for, and I look forward to letting them know that I will represent them with my heart and soul as well. They are the face of government in many, many communities, and I have my utmost respect for all of them. So I just want to tell you uh, briefly, I'll be sharing a number of my priorities with all of you if you would reconvene again at 3 o'clock today. I'll be also talking about how we'll be combating COVID getting direct aid to New Yorkers more quickly, and changing the culture of Albany. And that's why I'm looking forward to a fresh collaborative approach. It's how I've always conducted myself. It'll be nothing new for me, but it's something I'm planning on introducing to the state capitol. So I'll be heading to a meeting very shortly with our leaders here. We have much to discuss. We'll be reporting on that afterward. Uh, but at this time, I'll take a few questions. And let me call on Marina from AP right now. Marina. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in the hands of the, uh, the assembly. They've been conducting themselves with great professionalism, and I'm going to allow the continuation of the separation of branches of government and allow them to do their work. Uh, Bernadette from the Post. Hi, Governor. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering, rent is obviously a massive issue right now in the state. What have you done to get more money out the door to the provision of approved applications quickly? as fewer than a quarter of households for both rent urban and low-income in New York City has applications in according to the state comptroller, but what's being done to reach these individuals that have yet to get their applications in? Bernadette, you've hit on one of my top priorities. You'll be hearing more about that this afternoon, but it'll continue a, a multifaceted approach, deploying more people to the crisis, realizing that there's many people who have not been even aware that they have these resources available to them, and connecting them with the landlords. So I will be uh, assembling a, a team of individuals beginning today to assess this, but to wait not one second longer in terms of how we get this relief out to people. It's there. It needs to be in their hands so they can start getting their lives back in order and re reducing some of the incredible stress that these families and individuals are under. It's, it's not absolutely unnecessary. Uh, uh, Rami from Univision, and the, you here as well, Rami? Yes, hello. Okay. Um, we want to know what is going to happen with the school of workers, uh, the, the base to come, and also we want to know if your gathering or your uh, staff uh, cannot be part of them and my money to do. Well, we're doing quite a bit of reach out and you'll be, I'll be identifying my administration, the members, uh, as time goes on. I've uh, requested and granted myself a 40-day, five-day transition period. I think everyone understands that I needed to assemble my two constitutional officers, officers immediately, which I have announced, and these are uh, incredible individuals with great integrity and a lot of government experience. I want people who know what they're doing surrounding me, and I'll listen to their advice. And so I have my, my secretary, Karen Keogh, has been identified, as well as Elizabeth Fine as counsel, but I believe in a full a fully diverse cabinet, and that is going to be a high priority. With respect to the excluder worker program, I'm going to go at that with the same intensity that I am with this rental program. The money's there, these people were not eligible for other forms of assistance, and they're hurting, and they're part of the New York family, and I'm going to make that very clear. So, 
uh, making sure we deal with that. Uh, Bob McCarthy, Buffalo News. Good morning, Governor. Is there one particular project, one particular big thing that you would like to accomplish as governor? I want people to believe in their government again. It's important to me that people have faith. Our strength comes from the faith and the confidence of the people who put us in these offices. And I take that very seriously. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew from NBC4, please. Yes, Governor, thank you very much. You talked about the spirit of collaboration. I know you have spoken with Mayor de Blasio, but throughout the pandemic, the mayor and Governor Cuomo almost never appeared in the same room despite the fact that their interests could have and should have been aligned. How soon can we expect to see you sitting at a joint news conference with Mayor de Blasio? And do you agree with his decision to mandate vaccines for teachers in New York City? Will you do that for teachers all across the state? I'll be making announcements about that uh, later today, as well as uh, throughout the week, as I have a chance to assemble all the stakeholders now that I am officially governor and I have the ability to work with them. I'll also be discussing this with our leadership from the Assembly and the Senate. This is what collaboration looks like. Uh, we, I have sat down unofficially with Mayor de Blasio. We had some very nice pastries last week and had a great conversation. And he actually called me prior to his announcement yesterday to alert me. And we talked about this era of cooperation, that there's be no blindsiding. There'll be just full cooperation because I need his best and brightest, brightest integrated with my best and brightest. And that's how we'll get through this. And for me, that's just a simple approach. It's what I've always done. But if I can invite you back later this afternoon at 3 o'clock, I'll have a chance to address uh, more thoroughly the issues that were raised this morning as well as some of my other priorities. So thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone coming out today. Okay. So there you see the 57th governor of the state of New York, Kathy Hochul, taking a few questions. Uh, again, she'll speak uh, at larger extent later today at 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. She said brevity will be the hallmark of her administration, so she does <laughs> like to keep it brief. But you heard a couple of, uh, I guess, a couple of opening points, uh, first of which being that COVID and uh, the eviction moratorium will be first and second mm -hmm. on her list on her agenda, but also that she wants people to believe in government again, and that's probably the, one of the bigger hurdles. I think the two major points that she made is that she wants a fresh collaborative approach to government. So what that means to the legislature is no more di a, of a dictator who's yeah. going to tell them what to do. She's going to work with them. And secondly, as regards to our own mayor, Mayor de Blasio, she said the words, there will be no blindsiding, which is something that um, Bill de Blasio had to endure through all the time that Mario, the, that Andrew yeah. Cuomo was the, was the governor. The collaboration <laughs> aspect, though, it, it sounds good in theory. How realistic is it? Well, I think that that's her intent. Yeah. And I think that as if you take a look at the whole body of her work when she was um, on local government in Buffalo, that's how she operated. I read, I read something recently that said that she, when she was um, a town clerk and before that, she would go to coffee shops and she would talk to people and she would say, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Because she did want to have a collaborative approach and she wanted to make sure that she could express the will of the people. And I think you're going to see that in her. I think she's that kind of person. And it seems like already on the Mayor de Blasio side, he, she just said he called and told me before he made the announcement yesterday about mandating vaccines. So at least it seems like on his part, maybe there's a little bit of a change well, too. It also seems to indicate that she's when she meets now with the legislative leaders, which she's doing right as we speak, she's going to talk to them about how well that they would support going, what steps they would support, whether they would require state employees to have vaccines, whether they would inquire other companies to have vaccines and see how far they're willing to go to support her in whatever uh, mandate she issues. Mm -hmm. Going to be different, I guess, a, a different relationship with Mayor de Blasio for this, this short period of time, um, whereas we just mentioned you didn't see them both in the same room uh, during this pandemic. Now there's got to be a little, you talk about the collaboration, she's got to familiarize herself a little bit more with the downstaters and she's going to need probably his help. Well, I think you have to realize that if she wants to get reelected, she has to make an appeal to New York City voters. And she has to show them that she cares about them. And I think there are two issues that people in New York City care about. One is the pandemic and the masking and the vaccines and the economic resurgence. Yeah. And the second is the MTA and congestion pricing. Those yeah. are two hot button topics that really will determine whether she can get reelected. And speaking of that, we want to bring in political expert Javier Lacayo. 
he joins us now to talk about what could happen in uh, New York's next gubernatorial election. Javier, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Javier. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, there yes, you are. Okay. Just wanted to, just wanted to make sure. So let, let's bring you into the conversation here. I mean, four months until the Democratic gubernatorial primary here in New York. How do you think now Governor Hochul's chances are? I mean, she has a short amount of time to make a big impression across the state. Look, obviously, Governor Hochul uh, is going to have some tremendous advantages going into a primary. She will be running as the incumbent, um, which will be helpful for name recognition. It will be helpful as far as raising money. But I think there's some stabilities in her record. Uh, just two years ago, she ran statewide for re-election um, in, a, in a race where she really struggled primarily in New York City. Uh, she barely won statewide by about 100,000 votes. And some of the things in her past, such as her, uh, you know, notorious opposition of driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants when she was Erie County clerk, her alignment with the NRA, for example, when she was uh, running for Congress, these are things that I think could be really problematic for her in a Democratic primary, especially as she's trying to win over New York City voters. So let me ask you this. Who, where do you see the competition? If you see vulnerabilities already, who do you see as some potential, I guess, opponents running against her? Absolutely. Look, I think that the, uh, the biggest challenger uh, and, and potentially the real front runner of this race is going to end up being Attorney General Tish James. Uh, we have seen what a powerful platform the attorney general's office is uh, when running uh, for the governor's office. Uh, both Elliot Spitzer and Andrew Cuomo were attorney general before they successfully won statewide election. Uh, and Tish James also hails from New York City. Uh, you know, the attorney general has incredibly deep relationships. She's beloved. And her profile has been elevated even more now that she was really the one that was able to bring accountability uh, and oust uh, a governor that folks have been uh, trying to, to, to get out of office for, for years now. Javier, it's Marcia Kramer. I have a question for you. The Democratic State Committee has to meet in January to pick the official nominee of the party. Do you think that the party gives her the nomination, or will they lean towards somebody like Tish James or all the other people who are interested in running, Tom Suozzi and, and uh, Steve Ballone and the cast of thousands that, that are going to say, hey, pick me? Yeah. It, you know, Marsha, it's really early to tell right now. Uh, I, I have a little bit of trouble seeing um, the, the state party firmly getting, uh, you know, behind uh, uh, Kathy right now. Uh, I, I think everyone is kind of waiting and seeing uh, how the incoming governor does in the first few months, um, particularly with the incredible pressing issues that, that we're facing right now when it comes to COVID, uh, the housing crisis, the employment crisis. So I think we'll have to wait and see. All right, Javier Lacayo, thanks so much. Good to talk with you as always, and thank you for taking a few moments for us here. Good to see you. Thank you. So we have the optimistic approach. We have mm -hmm. a little bit more of a pessimistic approach there. <laughs> She's only been sworn in for about 10 hours and, and 20 minutes. But again, we still have to look at it from both sides. Well, I think that he, that he raises an interesting question. Yeah. And that is that if the state Democratic Party really wants to win, they're going to look at the person they think has the best chance yeah. and who's raised the most money. Yeah, and that's a really big deal. So. You don't you don't get a grace period, no matter what the situation. Not in New York. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. All, All right, right. Marsha, thank you very much. Good thank to you, see Marcia. you, Marsha. As always. And Governor Hochul will address, as she mentioned, the state this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We'll have live coverage of her remarks right here on CBS2 and streaming on CBS and New York. And, of course, we will have the latest on the inauguration of Governor Hochul coming up on CBS2 News at noon, which will come your way in about 90 minutes. For now, we return you to regular programming on CBS2 and CBS and New York.